wise statesmen, established these great self-evident truths, that when in the distant future some man, some faction, some interest, should set up the doctrine that none but rich men, or none but wise men, were entitled to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, their posterity should look up again at the Declaration of Independence and take courage to renew the battle which their fathers began. At S1, Abraham Lincoln, Hunnick Moon, the U.S. Navy delivered George Bush back home for good on Christmas Eve, 1944. The war in the Pacific raged on over the next half year with a lied forces taking Southeast Asia, the Netherlands East Indies Indonesia, and islands such as Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Barbara Pierce quit Smith College in her sophomore year to marry George. Prescott and Mother Bush gave a splendid prenuptial dinner at the Greenwich Field Club. The wedding took place January 6, 1945, in the Wright, New York Presbyterian Church, as the U.S. Third Fleet bombarded the main Philippine island of Luzon in preparation for invasion. Afterwards there was a glamorous reception for 300 at, at the Wanese Country Club, the newlyweds honeymooned at the Cloisters, the five-star hotel on Sea Island, Georgia, with swimming, tetanus and golf. Georgia's next assignment was to train pilots at Norfolk, Virginia Naval Air Station. Georgia's duty was light. As for other young marrieds, whose husbands were between wars and tours. This was kind of an extended and paid honeymoon. At S2 Japan surrendered in August. That fall, George and Barbara Bush moved to New Haven where Bush entered Yale University. He and Barbara moved into an apartment at 37 Hill House Avenue across the street from Yale President Charles Seymour. College life was good to George, what he saw of it. A college career usually occupies four years, but we know that George Bush is a rapidly moving man. Thus he was pleased with the special arrangement made for veterans by which Yale allowed him to get his degree after attending classes for only two and a half years. Bush and his friends remember it all fondly, as the representatives of the fashionable set, M. Members of Bush's class have since sighed with nostalgia for those days of the late 1940s. Trolley cars still rumbled along the New Haven streets. On autumn afternoons they would be crowded with students going out to football games at the Yale Bowl, scattering pennies along the way and shouting grave accent scramble to the street kids diving for them emphasis added dot at S3 in 1947. Barbara gave birth to George W. Bush, the president's namesake. By the time of his 1948 graduation, he had been elected to Phi Beta Kappa, an honor traditionally associated with academic achievement. A great deal is known about George Bush's career at Yale, except the part about books and studies. Unfortunately for those who would wish to consider his intellectual accomplishment, everything about that has been sealed shut and is top secret. The Yale administration says they have turned over to the FBI custody of all of Bush's academic records, allegedly because the FBI needs such access to check the resume at the AKT.
of important office holders. From all available testimony, his mental life before college was anything but outstanding. His campaign literature claims that, as a veteran, Bush was serious at Yale. But we cannot check exactly how he achieved election to Phi Beta Kappa in his abbreviated college experience. Without top-secret clearance, we cannot consult his test results, read his essays, or learn much about his performance in class. We know that his father was a trustee of the university, in charge of developmental fundraising, and his family friends were in control of the U.S. Secret Services. A great deal is known, however, about George Bush's status at Yale. His fellow student John H. Chaffee, later the U.S. Senator from Rhode Island and Secretary of the Navy, declared, We didn't see much of him because he was married. But I guess my first impression was that he was and I don't mean this in an derogatory fashion in the inner set. The movers and shakers. The establishment. I don't mean he put on airs or anything, but just everybody knew him. Chaffee, like Bush, and Dan Quayle, was in the important national fraternity. Delta Kappa Epsilon DK or the Geeks. But Chappie says, I never remember seeing him there. He wasn't one to hang around with the fellows. At S4 the tomb George Bush, in fact, passed his most important days and nights at Yale in the strange companionship of the senior year Skull and Bones Society. At S5 out of those few who were chosen for Bones membership, George was the last one. To be notified of his selection this honor is traditionally reserved for the highest of the high and mighty. His father. Prescott Bush, several other relatives and partners, and Roland and Admiral Harriman, who sponsored the Bush family, were also members of this secret society. The undoubted political and financial power associated with Skull and Bones has given rise to many popular questions about the nature and origin of the group. Its members have fed the mystery with false leads and silly speculations. The order was incorporated in 1856 under the name Russell Trust Association. By special act of the state legislature in 1943, its trustees are exempted from the normal requirement of filing corporate reports with the Connecticut Secretary of State. As of 1978, all business of the Russell Trust was handled by its loan trustee, Brown Brothers Harriman partner John B. Madden. Junior Madden started with Brown Brothers Harriman in 1946. Under senior partner Prescott Bush, George Bush's father. Each year, Skull and Bones members select tap 15 third-year Yale students to replace them in the senior group the following year. Graduating members are given a sizable cash bonus to help them get started in life. Older graduate members, the so-called patriarchs, give special backing in business, politics, espionage and legal careers to graduate bonesmen who exhibit talent or usefulness. The home of Skull and Bones on a Yale campus is a stone building resembling a mausoleum, and known as the tomb. 
Initiations take place on Deer Island in the St. Lawrence River, an island owned by the Russell Trust Association with regular reunions on Deer Island and at Yale. Initiation rites reportedly include strenuous and traumatic activities of the new members, while immersed naked in mud and in a coffin. More important is the sexual autobiography the initiate tells the order all the sex secrets of his young life. Weakened men of defenses against manipulation and the blackmail potential of such information have obvious permanent uses in enforcing loyalty among members. The loyalty is intense. One of Bush's former teachers, whose own father was of Skull and Bones members, told our interviewer that his father used to stab his little Skull and Bones pin into his skin to keep it in place when he took a bath. Members continue throughout their lives to unburden themselves on their psychosexual thoughts to their Bones brothers even if they are no longer sitting in a coffin. This has been the case with President George Bush, for whom these ties are reported to have a deep personal meaning. Beyond the psychological manipulation associated with Freemasonic mummery, there are very solid political reasons for Bush's strong identification with this cult. Observers of Skull and Bones Apologists and critics alike have accepted various deceptive notions about the order. There are two outstanding among these falsehoods, one that it is essentially an American group, an assembly of wealthy, elite patriots that is in fact an agency for British Empire penetration and subversion of the American Republic and two that it is somehow a unique center of conspiratorial control over the United States. This misconception is certainly understandable, given the rather astonishing number of powerful, historically important and grotesquely anti-human individuals who have come out of skull and bones. But there are in fact congruent organizations at other Ivy League colleges, which reflect, as to skull and bones, the overarching oligarchical power of several heavily intermarried financier families. The mistaken, speculative notions may be corrected by examining the history of skull and bones viewed within the reality of the American Eastern Establishment. Skull and Bones The Russell Trust Association was first established among the class graduating from Yale in 1833. Its founder was William Huntington Russell of Middletown, Connecticut. The Russell family was the master of incalculable wealth derived from the largest U.S. criminal organization of the 19th century, Russell and Company, the Great Opium Syndicate. There was at that time a deep suspicion of, and national revulsion against, Freemasonry and secret organizations in the United States fostered in particular by the anti-Masonic writings of former U.S. President John Quincy Adams. Adams stressed that those who take oaths to politically powerful international secret societies cannot be depended on for loyalty to a democratic republic. But the Russells were protected as part of the multiply intermarried grouping of families then ruling Connecticut see accompanying chart. The blood-proud members of the Russell, Pierpont, Edwards, Burt, Griswold, Day, Alsop and Hubbard families were prominent in the pro-British party within the state. 
many of their sons would be among the members chosen for the Skull and Bones Society over the years. The background to Skull and Bones is a story of opium and empire, and a bitter struggle for political control over the new U.S. Republic. Samuel Russell, second cousin to Bones founder William H. Established Russell and Company in 1823. Its business was to acquire opium from Turkey and smuggle it into China, where it was strictly prohibited, under the armed protection of the British Empire. The prior, predominant American gang in this field had been the syndicate created by Thomas Handacid Perkins of Newbury Port. Massachusetts, an aggregation of the self-styled Blue Bloods or Brahmins of Boston's North Shore. Forced out of the lucrative African slave trade by U.S. law and Caribbean slave revolts, leaders of the Cabot, Lowell, Higgins and Forbes, Cushing and Sturgis families had married Perkins siblings and children. The Perkins Opium Syndicate made the fortune and established the power of these families. By the 1830s, the Russells had bought out the Perkins Syndicate and made Connecticut the primary center of the U.S. opium racket. Massachusetts families Coolidge, Sturgis, Forbes and Delano joined Connecticut Allsop and New York both smuggler millionaires under the Russell auspices. Asterisk asterisk certain of the prominent Boston opium families, such as Cabot and Welt, did not affiliate directly with Russell, Connecticut and Yale, but were identified instead with Harvard. John Quincy Adams and other patriots had fought these men for a quarter century by the time the Russell Trust Association was set up with its open pirate emblem skull and bones. With British ties of family, shipping and merchant banking, the old New England Tories had continued their hostility to American independence after the Revolutionary War of 1775-83. These pretended conservative patriots proclaimed Thomas Jefferson's 1801 presidential inauguration radical user patient. The Massachusetts Tories Essex Junto joined with Vice President Aaron Burt, Jr., a member of the Connecticut Edwards and Pierpont families and Burr's cousin and law partner Theodore Dwight, in political moves designed to break up the United States and return it to British allegiance. The U.S. Nationalist Leader former Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, exposed the plan in 1804. Burr shot him to death in a duel, then led a famous abortive conspiracy to form a new empire in the Southwest, with territory to be torn from the USA and Spanish Mexico. For the Blue Bloods, the romantic figure of Aaron Burr was ever afterwards the symbol of British feudal revenge against the American Republic. The Connecticut Tory families hosted the infamous Hartford Convention in 1815, toward the end of the Second War between the U.S. and Britain the War of 1812. Their secessionist propaganda was rendered impotent by America's defensive military victory. This faction then retired from the open political arena, pursuing instead entirely private and covert alliances with the British Empire. The incestuously intermarried Massachusetts and Connecticut families associated themselves with the British East India Company in the criminal opium traffic into China.
These families made increased profits as partners and surrogates for the British during the bloody 1839-42 Opium War. The race war of British forces against Chinese defenders. Samuel and William Huntington Russell were quiet, wary builders of their faction's power. An intimate colleague of opium gangster Samuel Russell wrote this about him. While he lived, no friend of his would venture to mention his name in print. While in China, he lived for about 25 years almost as a hermit. Hardly known outside of his factory the Canton Warehouse compound except by the chosen few who enjoyed his intimacy and by his good friend, Oakwell Chinese Security Director for the British East India Company but studying commerce. In its broadest sense, as well as its minutest details, returning home with well-earned wealth he lived hospitably in the midst of his family and a small circle of intimates. Scorning words and pretensions from the bottom of his heart, he was the truest and staunchest of friends. Hating notoriety, he could always be absolutely counted on for every good work which did not involve publicity. The Russell's Skull and Bones Society was the most important of their domestic projects which did not involve publicity. The police blotter type review of Russell's organization will show why the secret order, though powerful, was not the unique organ of conspiracy for the U.S. Eastern establishment. The following gentlemen were among Russell's partners. Augustine Heard, 1785-1868 ship captain and pioneer U.S. opium smuggler. John Cleed Green 1800-75 married to Sarah Griffswald, gave a fortune in opium profits to Princeton University, financing three Princeton buildings and four professorships, trustee of the Princeton Theological Seminary for 25 years. Sabiel Abbott 1811-93 His opium fortune financed the construction of the Columbia University New York City campus. Father of Columbia's president said low. John Murray Forbes 1813-98 His opium millions financed the career of author Ralph Waldo Emerson, who married Forbes's daughter and bankrolled the establishment of the Bell Telephone Company, whose first president was Forbes's son. Joseph Coolidge. His Augustine Heard Agency got $10 million yearly as surrogates for the Scottish dope runners Jardine Mason during the fighting in China. His son organized the United Fruit Company. His grandson. Archibald Carey Coolidge was the founding executive officer of the Anglo-Americans Council on Foreign Relations. Warren Delano, Jr., Chief of Russell and Company in Canton, grandfather of U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Russell Sturgis. His grandson by the same name was chairman of the Bering Bank in England, financiers of the Far East opium trade. Such persons as John C. Green and A. A. Lowe, whose names adorn various buildings at Princeton and Columbia Universities, made little attempt to hide the criminal origin of their influential money. Similarly with the Cabots, the Higginsons and the Welds for Harvard. The secret groups at other colleges are analogous and closely related to Yale Skull and Bones. Princeton has its eating clubs, 
especially Ivy Club and Cottage Club, whose oligarchical tradition runs from Jonathan Edwards and Aaron Burr through the Dulles brothers. At Harvard there is the ultra-blue-blooded Porcelain known also as the Pork or Pig Club Theodore Rosa Veltbrand to the German Kaiser of his membership there. Franklin Rosa Velt was a member of the slightly lower Fly Club. A few of the early initiates in Skull and Bones went on to careers in obvious defiance of the order's oligarchical character. To such were the scientists Benjamin Silliman, Jr. Skull and Bones, 1837 and William Chauvinet Skull and Bones, 1840. This reflects the continued importance of Republican factions at Yale, Harvard and other colleges during the middle three decades of the 19th century. Silliman and Chauvinet became enemies of everything Skull and Bones stood for, while a Yale secret group rapidly conformed to the Russell's expectations. Yale was a northern college favored by southern slave-owning would-be aristocrats. Among Yale's southern students were John C. Calhoun, later the famous South Carolina defender of slavery against nationalism, and Judah P. Benjamin, later Secretary of State for the Slave Owners Confederacy. Young South Carolinian Joseph Heatley Dulles, whose family bought their slaves with the money from contract security work for the British conquerors in India, was in a previous secret Yale group, the Society of Brothers in Unity. At Yale Dulles worked with the Northern Secessionists and attached himself to Daniel Lord their two families clothed together in the fashion of a gang. The Lords became powerful Anglo-American Wall Street lawyers, and J. H. Dulles's grandson was the father of Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. In 1832-33 Skull and Bones was launched under the Russell pirate flag. Among the early initiates of the order were Henry Roots Jackson S.M. the 1839 the leader of the 1861 Georgia Secession Convention and post-Civil War president of the Georgia Historical Society thus the false accounts of the good old slavery days and the bad northern invaders John Perkins, Jr. S.M. the 1840. Chairman of the 1861 Louisiana Secession Convention, who'd fled abroad for 13 years after the Civil War, and William Taylor Sullivan Barry S.M.B. 1841 the national leader of the Secession at wing of the Democratic Party during the 1850s, and Chairman of the 1861 Mississippi Secession Convention. Alfonso Taft was a bonesman alongside William H. Russell in the class of 1833. As U.S. Attorney General in 1876-77, Alfonso Taft helped organize the backroom settlement of the deadlocked 1876 presidential election. The bargain gave Rutherford B. Hayes the presidency 1877-81 and withdrew the U.S. troops from the South, where they had been enforcing blacks' rights. Alfonso's son, William Howard Taft S.M.B. 1878 was U.S. president from 1909 to 1913. President Taft's son. Robert Alfonso Taft S. and B. 1910 was a leading U.S. Senator after World War I. I
his family's Anglo-Saxon racial slash ancestral preoccupation with the disease which crippled Robert Taft's leadership of American nationalist conservatives. Other pre-Civil War bonesmen were William M. Everts S.M.B. 1837 Wall Street A Journey for British and Southern Slave Owner Projects Collaborator of Taft in the 1876 Bargain U.S. Secretary of State 1877-81 Morris R. Waite S.M.B. 1837 Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court 1874-88 whose rulings destroyed many rights of African Americans gained in the Civil War. He helped his cohorts Taft and Everts arrange the 1876 presidential settlement scheme to pull the rights enforcing U.S. troops out of the South. Daniel Coy Gilman S.M.B. 1852 co-incorporator of the Russell Trust founding president of Johns Hopkins University as a great center for the racialist eugenics movement. Andrew D. White, S.M.B. 1853 founding president of Cornell University, psychic researcher and diplomatic cohort of the Venetian, Russian and British oligarchies. John C. M. B. P. S. M. B. 1856 General Counsel for the Vanderbilt Railroads. He helped the Harriman family to enter into high society by about the mid-1880s. The Skull and Bones membership roster began to change from its earlier, often scholarly, coloration the change reflected the degradation of American political and economic life by imperialist, neo-pagan and racialist ideology. Irving Fisher S. and B. 1888 became the racialist high priest of the economics faculty Yale professor 1896-1946 and a famous merchant of British Empire propaganda for free trade and reduction of the non-white population. Fisher was founding president of the American Eugenics Society under the financial largesse of Admiral Harriman's mother. Gifford Pinchot S. and B. 1889 invented the aristocrats' conservation movement. He was President Theodore Rosa Health's chief forester substituting federal land control in place of Abraham Lincoln's free land to families farm creation program. Pins shows British Empire activism included the Psychical Research Society and his vice presidency of the first International Eugenics Congress in 1912. Helping Pinchot initiate this century's racialist environmentalism were his cohorts George W. Woodruff S. and B. 1889 Teddy Rosa Health's Assistant Attorney General and Acting Interior Secretary, and Henry Solon Graves S. and B. 1892 Chief U.S. Forester 1910-20. Frederick E. Bayer Hauser S. and B. 1896, owner of vast tracts of American forest, was a follower of Pinchot's movement. While the Bayer Hauser family were active collaborators of British South African super races Cecil Rhodes. This family's friendship with President George Bush is a vital factor in the present environmentalist movement. With Henry L. Stimson S. and B. 1888 we come to the Eastern Liberal Establishment which has ruled America during the 20th century. Stimson was President Taft's Secretary of War 1911-13 and President Herbert Hoover's Secretary of State 1929-33.
as Secretary of War 1940-45 this time under President Harry Truman. Stimson pressed Truman to drop the atomic bomb on the Japanese. This decision involved much more than merely pragmatic military considerations. These Anglophiles, up through George Bush, have opposed the American Republic's tradition of alliance with national aspirations in Asia, and they worried that the invention of nuclear energy would too powerfully unsettle the world's toleration for poverty and misery. Both the U.S. and the atom had better be dreaded, they thought. The present century owes much of its record of horrors to the influential Anglophile American families which came to dominate and employ the skull and bones society as a political recruiting agency, particularly the Harrimans, Whitney's, Vanderbilt's, Rockefellers and their lawyers, the Lords and Tax and Bundy's. The politically aggressive Guarantee Trust Company, run almost entirely by Skull and Bones initiates, was a financial vehicle of these families in the early 1900s. Guarantee Trust's support for the Bolshevik and Nazi revolutions overlap the more intense endeavors in these fields by the Harrimans. George Walker and Prescott Bush a few blocks away, and in Berlin. Skull and Bones was dominated from 1913 onward by the circles of Admiral Harriman. They displaced remaining traditionalists such as Douglas MacArthur from power in the United States. For George Bush, the Skull and Bones Society is more than simply the British, as opposed to the American, strategic tradition. It is merged in a family and personal network within which his whole life has been, in a sense, handed to him prepackaged. Britain's Yale Flying Unit during Prescott Bush's student days. The Harriman set at Yale decided that World War I was sufficiently amusing that they ought to get into it as recreation. They formed a special Yale unit of the Naval Reserve Flying Corps at the instigation of F. Truby Davison. Since the United States was not at war, and a Yale students were going to serve Britain, a Yale unit was privately and lavishly financed by F. Truby's father, Henry Davison, the senior managing partner at J.P. Morgan and Co. At that time, the Morgan Bank was the official financial agency for the British government in the United States. A Yale unit's leader was amateur pilot Robert A. Lovett. They were based first on Long Island, New York, then in Palm Beach, Florida. A Yale unit has been described I love its family and friends in a collective biography of the Harriman set. Training for the Yale flying unit was not exactly boot camp. Davidson's father helped finance them royally and newspapers of the day dubbed them the Millionaire's Unit. They cut rakish figures, and knew it. Though some dismissed them as dilettantes, the hearts of young Long Island bells fluttered at the sight. In Palm Beach, they ostentatiously pursued the relaxed style. They were rolled about in wheelchairs by African slaves amid tropical gardens and coconut palms, wrote the unit's historian. For light exercise, they learned to glance at their new wristwatches with an air of easy nonchalance. Lovett was made chief of the unit's private club, the Wags, whose members started their sentences. 
being a whack and therefore a superman. Despite the snide comments of those who dismissed them as frivolous rich boys, Lovett's unit proved to be daring and imaginative warriors when they were dispatched for active duty in 1917 with Britain's Royal Naval Air Service. At S6 Lovett was transferred to the U.S. Navy after the U.S. joined Britain in World War I. A Yale flying unit was the glory of skull and bones. Roland Harriman Prescott Bush and their 1917 Bones mates selected for 1918 membership in the secret order. These Yale Flying Unit leaders, Robert Lovett, Jeff Truby Davison, Artemis Lambgates, and John Martin Voorhees. Unit Flyers David Sinton Ingalls and Ed Truby's brother, Harry P. Davidson who became Morgan Vice Chairman were tacked for the 1920 Skull and Bones. Lovett did not actually have a senior year at Yale. He was tapped for Skull and Bones not on the old campus but at a naval station in West Palm Beach. His initiation instead of being conducted in the grave accent tomb on High Street, occurred at the headquarters of the Navy's Northern Bombing Group between Dunkirk and Calais. At S7 some years later, Admiral Berriman gathered Lovett, Prescott Bush and other pets into the utopian oligarchs community a few miles to the north of Palm Beach called Jupiter Island Sea Chapter 4. British Empire loyalists flew right from a Yale unit into U.S. strategy-making positions. Jeff Truby Davison was assistant U.S. Secretary of War for Air from 1926 to 1933. David S. Ingalls on the board of Jupiter Islands Pan American Airways was meanwhile Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Aviation 1929-32. Following the American Museum of Natural History's Hitler Wright 1932 Eugenics Congress, Davidson resigned his government their post to become the museum's president. Then, under the Harriman Lovett national security regime of the early 1950s, Jeff Truby Davison became director of personnel for the new Central Intelligence Agency. Robert Lovett was assistant secretary of war for air from 1941 to 45. Lovett's 1918 Bones mate Artemis Gates chosen by Prescott and his fellows became Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Air in 1941. Gates retained this post throughout the Second World War until 1945. Having a man like Gates up there, who owed his position to Admiral Bob Prescott and their set, was quite reassuring to young naval aviator George Bush, especially so, when Bush would have to worry about the record being correct concerning his controversial fatal crash. Other important bonesman Richard M. Bissell, Jr. was a very important man to the denizens of Jupiter Island. He graduated from Yale in 1932, a year after the Hermanites bought the island. Though not in skull and bones, Bissell was the younger brother of William Truesdale Bissell, a bonesman from the class of 1925. Their father, Connecticut insurance executive Richard M. Bissell, Sr had put the U.S. insurance industry's inside knowledge of all fire-insured industrial plants at the disposal of government planners during World War I. The senior Bissell, 
a powerful Yale alumnus, was also the director of the Neuropsychiatric Institute of the Hartford. Retreat for the Insane, there, in 1904, Yale graduate Clifford Beers underwent mind-destroying treatment which led this mental patient to found the Mental Hygiene Society, a major Yale-based skull and bones project. This would evolve into the CIA's cultural engineering effort of the 1950s, the drugs and brainwashing adventure known as MKUltra. Richard M. Bissell, Jr. studied at the London School of Economics in 1932 and 1933, and taught at Yale from 1935 to 1941. He then joined Harriman's entourage in the U.S. government. Bissell was an economist for the Combined Shipping Adjustment Board in 1942-43, while Abril Harriman was the U.S. leader of that board in London. In 1947 and 1948, Bissell was Executive Secretary of the Harriman Commission, otherwise known as the President's Commission on Foreign Aid. When Harriman was the administrator of the Marshall Plan, Bissell was assistant administrator. Harriman was director of Mutual Security 1951-53, while Bissell was consultant to the director of Mutual Security 1952. Bissell then joined F. Truby Davison at the Central Intelligence Agency. When Alan Dulles became CIA director, Bissell was one of his three aides. Why could this be of interest to our Floridians? We saw in Chapter 4 that the Great Anti-Castro Covered Initiative of 1959-61 was supervised by an awesome array of Harriman agents. We need now add to that assessment only the fact that the detailed management of the invasion of Cuba, and of the assassination planning, and the training of the squads for these jobs, was given into the hands of Richard M. Bissell, Jr. This 1961 invasion failed. Fidel Castro survived the widely discussed assassination plots against him. But the initiative succeeded in what was probably its core purpose, to organize a force of multi-use professional assassins. The Florida-trained killers stayed in business under the leadership of Ted Shackley, they were all around the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. They kept going with the Operation Phoenix mass murder of Vietnamese civilians, with Middle East drug and terrorist programs, and with George Bush's Contra Wars in Central America. Harvey Hollister Bundy S. and B. 1909 was Henry L. Stimson's Assistant Secretary of State 1931-33. Then he was Stimson's Special Assistant Secretary of War, alongside Assistant Secretary Robert Lovett of Skull and Bones and Brown Brothers Harriman. Harvey's son William P. Bundy S. and B. 1939 was a CIA officer from 1951 to 1961. As a 1960s defense official, he pushed the Harriman Dulles scheme for a Vietnam War. Harvey's other son, McGeorge Bundy S. and B. 1940 co-authored Stimson's memoirs in 1948. As President John Kennedy's Director of National Security, McGeorge Bundy organized the whitewash of the Kennedy assassination, 
and immediately switched the U.S. policy away from the Kennedy pullout and back toward war in Vietnam. There was also Henry Luce, a bonesman of 1920 with David S. Ingalls and Harry Pomeroy. Luce published Time magazine, where his ironically named American century blustering was straight British Empire doctrine. Bury the Republics. Hail the Anglo-Saxon Conquerors. William Sloan Coffin. Tact for 1949 Skull and Bones by George Bush and his Bone Companions. Was from a long line of Skull and Bones Coffins. William Sloan Coffin was famous in the Vietnam War protest days as a leader of the left protest against the war. Was the fact that he was an agent of the Central Intelligence Agency embarrassing to William Sloan? This was no contradiction. His uncle, the Reverend Henry Sloan Coffin S&B 1897, had also been a peace agitator and an oligarchical agent. Uncle Henry was for 20 years president of the Union Theological Seminary, whose board chairman was Prescott Bush's partner Thatcher Brown. In 1937, Henry Coffin and John Foster Dulles led the U.S. delegation to England to found the World Council of Churches as a peace movement guided by the pro-Hitler faction in England. The coffins have been mainstays of the liberal death lobby for euthanasia and eugenics. The coffins outlasted Hitler, arriving into the CIA in the 1950s. Mary Howe Bradford S. and B. 1934 married Carol Warburg Rothschild in 1941. Carol's mother, Carol, was the acknowledged head of the Warburg family in America after World War I. I. This family had assisted the Harriman's rise into the world in the 19th and early 20th centuries in concert with the Salzburgers at the New York Times. They had used their American Jewish Committee and B'nai Brick to protect the Harriman Bush deals with Hitler. This made it nice for Avril Harriman, just like family, when Amory House Bradford worked on the planning group of Harriman's NATO Secretariat in London, 1951-52. Bradford was meanwhile assistant to the publisher of the New York Times, and went on to become general manager of the Times. Other modern bonesmen have been closely tied to George Bush's career. George Herbert Walker, Jr. S. and B. 1927 was the president's uncle and financial angel. In the 1970s he sold G.H. Walker and Company to White, Weld and Company and became the director of White, Weld, Company heir William Weld, the current Massachusetts governor, is an active Bush Republican. Publisher William F. Buckley S. and B. 1950 had a family oil business in Mexico. There Buckley was a close ally to CIA covered operations manager E. Howard Hunt, whose lethal antics were performed under the eyes of Miami Station and Jupiter Island. David Vildoran S. and B. 1963 was assistant to the director of the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization and a propaganda analyst for the U.S. Information Agency, before graduating from Yale. Thus while he was imbibing the British view at Oxford University 1963-65, Doran was already an Anglo-American intelligence operative, 
listed in the Speaker's Bureau of the American Embassy in London. David Doran was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1979 and became chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Though the Democrat who spoke knowingly of the parallel government operating in Iran country Doran's Intelligence Committee rulings have been not unexpectedly more and more favorable to his patriarch in the White House. Bush's own bones among the traditional artifacts collected and maintained within the high street tomb are human remains of various derivations. The following concerns one such set of skull and bones. Geronimo, an Apache faction leader and warrior, led the party of warriors on a raid in 1876. After Apaches were moved to the San Carlos Reservation in Arizona Territory, he led other raids against U.S. and Mexican forces well into the 1880s. He was captured and escaped many times. Geronimo was finally interned at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He became a farmer and joined the Christian congregation. He died at the age of 79 years in 1909, and was buried at Fort Sill. Three quarters of a century later, his tribesmen raised the question of getting their famous warrior reinterred back in Arizona. Ned Anderson was tribal chairman of the San Carlos Apache tribe from 1978 to 1986. This is the story he tells at S8. Around the fall of 1983, the leader of an Apache group in another section of Arizona said he was interested in having the remains of Geronimo returned to his tribe's custody. Taking up this idea, Anderson said that the remains properly belonged to his group as much as to the other Apaches. After much discussion, several Apache groups met at a kind of summit meeting held at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. The Army authorities were not favorable to the meeting and it only occurred through the intervention of the office of the governor of Oklahoma. As a result of this meeting, Ned Anderson was written up in the newspapers as an articulate Apache activist. Soon afterwards, in late 1983 or early 1984, the Skull and Bones member contacted Anderson and leaked evidence that Geronimo's remains had long ago been pilfered by Prescott Bush, George's father. The informant said that in May of 1918, Prescott Bush and five other officers at Fort Sill desecrated the grave of Geronimo. They took turns watching while they robbed the grave, taking items including a skull, some other bones, the horse bit and straps. These prizes were taken back to the tomb, the home of the Skull and Bones Society at Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. They were put into a display case which members and visitors could easily view upon entry to the building. The informant provided Anderson with photographs of the stolen remains, and a copy of a skull and bones log book in which the 1918 grave robbery had been recorded. The informant said that Skull and Bones members used the pilfered remains in performing some of their Thursday and Sunday night rituals, with Geronimo's skull sitting out on a table in front of them. Outraged, Anderson traveled to New Haven. He did some investigation on a Yale campus and held numerous discussions 
to learn what the Apaches would be up against. Then they took action. And what type of action would be most fruitful? Through an attorney. Ned Anderson asked the FBI to move into the case. The attorney conveyed to him the Bureau's response. If he would turn over every scrap of evidence to the FBI and completely remove himself from the case, they would get involved. He rejected this bargain, since it did not seem likely to lead toward recovery of Geronimo's remains. Due to his persistence, he was able to arrange the September 1986 Manhattan meeting with Jonathan Bush, George Bush's brother. Jonathan Bush vaguely assured Anderson that he would get what he had come after, and set a follow-up meeting for the next day. But Bush stalled Anderson believes this was to gain time to hide and secure the stolen remains against any possible rescue action. The Skull and Bones attorney representing the Bush family and managing the case was Endicott Peabody Davison. His father was the F. Truby Davison mentioned above who had been president of New York's American Museum of Natural History, and personnel director for the Central Intelligence Agency. The general attitude of this museum crowd has long been that natives should be stuffed and mounted for display to the fashionable set. Finally, after about 11 days, another meeting occurred. The display case was produced, which did in fact match the one in the photograph the informant had given to Ned Anderson. But the skull he was shown was that of the ten-year-old child, and Anderson refused to receive it or to sign a legal document promising to shut up about the matter. Anderson took his complaint to Arizona Congressman Morris Udall and John McCain III, but with no results. George Bush refused Congressman McCain's request that he meet with Anderson. Anderson wrote to Udall, enclosing the photograph of the wall case and skull at the tomb showing a black and white photograph of the living Geronimo, which members of the order had boastfully posted next to their display of his skull. Anderson quoted from a Skull and Bones Society internal history, entitled Continuation of the History of Our Order for the Century Celebration, June 17, 1933 by the little devil of D-121. From the war days WWI also sprang the mad expedition from the school of fire at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, that brought to the TOMB its most spectacular cook, the skull of Geronimo the Terrible. The Indian chief who had taken 49 white scalps an expedition in late May 1918 by members of four clubs i.e. four graduating class years of the society was at D.114 Burr Bones, Caliban and Dingbat D.115 Esmukit D.116 and Hellbender D.117 planned with great caution since in the words of one of them, six army captains robbing a grave wouldn't look good in the papers. The stern climax was recorded by Hellbender in the Black Book of D.117, The Ring of Pick on Stone and Thud of Earth on Earth alone disturbs the peace of the prairie. An axe pride opened the iron door of the tomb, and Pat Rydart Bush entered and started to dig. We dug in turn, 
each on relief taking a turn on the road as guards. Finally Pat Ryark Ellery James turned up a bridle. Soon a saddle horn and rod on leathers followed. Then wood and then, at the exact bottom of the small round hole, Pat Ryark James dug deep and pried out the trophy itself. We quickly closed the grave, shut the door and sped home to Pat Ryar Maglin's room, where we cleaned the bones. Pat Ryar Maglin sat on the floor liberally applying carbolic acid. The skull was fairly clean, having only some flesh inside and a little hair. I showered and hit the hay. A happy man. At S9, the other grave robber whose name is given, Ellery James. We encountered in Chapter 1. He was to be an usher at Prescott's wedding three years later. And the fellow who applied acid to the stolen skull, burning off the flesh and hair, was Neil Mallon. Years later, Prescott Bush and his partners chose Mallon as chairman of Dresser Industries. Mallon hired Prescott's son, George Bush, for George's first job. And George Bush named his son, Neil Mallon Bush, after the flesh picker. In 1988, the Washington Post ran an article originating from the establishment line Arizona Republic, entitled Skull for Scandal, Did Bush's Father Rob Geronimo's Grave? The article included a small quote from the 1933 Skull and Bones History of Our Order. An axe pride opened the iron door of the tomb, and Bush entered and started to dig and so forth, but neglected to include others' names beside Bush. According to the Washington Post, the document which Bush attorney Endicott Davison tried to get the Apache leader to sign, stipulated that Neb Anderson agreed it would be inappropriate for you, me, Jonathan Bush or anyone in association with us to make or permit any publication in connection with this transaction. Anderson called the document very insulting to Indians. Davison claimed later that the order's own history book is a hoax, but during the negotiations with Anderson, Bush's attorney demanded Anderson give up his copy of the book. At S1 at S0 Bush crony Fitzhugh Green gives the view of the president's backers on this affair, and conveys the arrogant racial attitude typical of skull and bones. Prescott Bush had a colorful side. In 1988 the press revealed the complaint of an Apache leader about Bush. This was Ned Anderson of San Carlos, Oklahoma 6, who charged that as a young army officer Bush stole the skull of Indian Chief Sick Geronimo and had it hung on the wall of Yale Skull and Bones Club. After exposure of grave accent true facts by Anderson, and consideration by some representatives in Congress, the issue faded from public sight. Whether or not this alleged skullduggery actually occurred, the mere idea casts the senior Bush in an adventurous light that S1 at S1 emphasis added. George Bush's crowning as a bonesman was intensely, personally important to him. These men were tacked for the class of 1948, Thomas William Ludlow Ashley Lucius Horatio Bidlow, Jr. George Herbert Walker Bush John Irwin Hawkins William Judkins Clark William James Conley, 
Jr., George Cook, I, 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 David, Charles Grimes, Richard Elwood, Jenkins, Richard Yersel, Mac, Thomas Wilder, Mosley, George Harold Fought, Jr., Samuel Sloan Walker, Jr., Howard Sayer Weaver, Valley A.U. will keep. Junior survivors of this 1948 Bones group were interviewed for a 1988 Washington Post campaign profile of George Bush. The members described their continuing intimacy with and financial support for Bush up through his 1980s vice presidency. Their original sexual togetherness at Yale is stressed. The relationships that were formed in the tomb where the society's meetings took place each Thursday and Sunday night during the academic year, have had a strong place in Bush's life. According to all 11 of his fellow Bones mentor, still alive. Several described in detail the ritual and the organization that built the bonds before giving his life history, each member had to spend a Sunday night reviewing his sex life in a talk known in the tomb as Sibi, or Canoodial Bliss. The first time you review your sex life. We went all the way around among the 15, said Lucius H. B. Glow, Jr., the retired Seattle attorney. That way you get everybody committed to a certain extent. It was a gradual way of building confidence. The sexual histories help break down the normal defenses of the members, according to several of the members from his class. William J. Conley, Jr., said, In Skull and Bones we all stand together. Fifteen brothers under the skin. It is the greatest allegiance in the world. At S1 at S2 here is our future U.S. president with the other wealthy, amoral young men, excited about their future unlimited power over the ignorant common people, sharing their sex secrets in a mausoleum surrounded by human remains. The excited young men are entirely directed by the patriarchs, the cynical alumni financiers who are the legal owners of the order. A Yale Tories who made Skull and Bones this chart depicts family relationships which were vital to the persons appearing on the chart. At less exalted levels of society, one is supposed to be praised or blamed only according to one's own actions. But in these Yale circles, family genealogy is an overwhelming consideration when evaluating individuals. Thus what we present here is more than simply a system of associations. It is a tradition which has operated powerfully on the emotions and judgment of the leaders of Yale University. They have merged their own identities into this tradition. Lines are directed downwards from parents to their children. The double hyphen signifies the marriage of the persons on either side. Family Chart Guide to the Yale Family Chart 1ref. Nodia Russell, one of 10 or 12 men who founded Yale University in 1701. Yale Trustee 1701 to 13. Pastor, First Congregational Church, Middletown, Courtsea. 1691 to 1716. To Ref. James Pierpont, most celebrated of the Yale founders. Yale Trustee, 1701-14. 3 William Russell, Yale Trustee 1745-61. Pastor, First Congregational Church, Middletown, Court 1716-61. 
for Jonathan Edwards, graduated Yale 1720. Ultra Calvinist theologian, president of Princeton University called then College of New Jersey. 5 Ref. Nodia Russell, graduated Yale 1750. 6 Pierpont Edwards 1750 to 1826, made Master of Connecticut Masons by the British Army occupying New York in 1783. He administered the estate of the traitor Benedict Arnold. 7 Aaron Burt, Sr., graduated Yale 1735. President of Princeton University College of New Jersey. 8. Matthew Alcott Russell. Graduated Yale 1769. Deacon of First Congregational Church, Middletown. Court for 30 years. Lawyer for the Middletown Russell family. Died C. 1817. 9. Captain John Russell. Died 1801 or 1802. 10. Henry W. Edwards. Governor of Connecticut 1833-1835-38. Protector of Samuel Russell's Opium Finance Enterprises. Patron of William Huntington Russell's New Secret Society. Skull and Bones. 11. Aaron Burt, Jr., U.S. Vice President 1801-08. Killed Alexander Hamilton in the duel in 1804. Secession Conspirator. Acquitted of treason in 1807, but wanted for murder. He fled to England. Returned to USA in 1812. Wall Street Lawyer, 1812-36. Hero of Imperial Anglo-Americans. 12 Theodore Dwight, 1764-1846. Law partner of his cousin Aaron Burt. Junior Secretary of the Secessionist Hartford Convention. 1815. He united the Connecticut pro-British party with Massachusetts Essex Chanto. 13 Timothy Dwight, secessionist. President of Yale, 1795 to 1817. 14 William Huntington Russell, 1809 to 85. Graduated Yale 1833. Founder of Skull and Bones Society or Russell Trust Association, which came to dominate Yale. Founded Prep School for Boys, 1836. His secret organization spread in the 1870s to Phillips Academy, the Andover, Massachusetts Prep School. 15. Samuel Russell. Born in 1789 in the main ancestral house of the Russell family of Middletown. This house had been owned by the co-founder of Yale, Nodia Russell I, and by William Russell III and his wife Mary, sister-in-law to Jonathan Edwards. He became head of the Middletown Russells. He established Russell and Company in 1823, which by the 1830s superseded Perkins Syndicate as largest American opium smuggling organization. His partners included leading Boston families. He founded the Russell Manufacturing Company, Middletown, in 1837. He was president of Middlesex County Bank. During the formative years of Skull and Bones, the fabulously wealthy Samuel Russell was undisputed king of Middletown. Note to reader. For the sake of clarity, 
We have omitted from this chart the ancestral line from Ref. James Pierpont to to his great grands on Ref. John Pierpont. Ref. John Pierpont wrote poetry for the pro-British secessionists. He denounced President Thomas Jefferson for saying that Pierpont's New England relatives were under the influence of the Horn of England. Rev. John was an employee of Aaron Burr's family during Burr's Western Conspiracy. Rev. John's daughter Julia married Connecticut-born British banker Junius Morgan and gave birth to U.S. financial kingpin John Pierpont Morgan, named for his grandfather Rev. John 